This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 92 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm talking to writing BFF, Daniel Wilcox. We're going to be talking all about uh, self-publishing, uh, as he has just released a new book called The Self-Publishing Blueprint. So we give uh, a kind of overview of self-publishing. We talk about things that we've learned. Yeah, and we have a bit of a giggle, so it's a fun episode. But first, to last week's question, which was... What is your focus for the last half of 2021? All right, so the first comment was from Ian Worrell, and he says, get as many of my books ready for beta readers and hopefully for publication. Do a NaNoWriMo again, make the push to get as close to my goal of posts to medium as possible. Christina said, Christina Adams says, my focus is to remain in denial. <laughs> I love that, that we're already halfway through 2021. On a more serious note, uh, it's to publish at least two more books this year. Val Neal says, I want to finish book two for fuck's sake. I love it. And she's sort of put a, a screaming gif. <laughs> I completely understand. That is how I feel about getting Trey and Sirens out as well. Kerry Hardisky says, keep working on drafting as much of the series as I can and going back to book five in July. Edwin says, I remain doggedly determined to get this third novel ready for release into the wild. Dharma Keller sa or Kellia says, um... I'm hoping to write and publish a non-fiction book called Breakthrough, Overcoming Creative Self-Doubt, Writer's Block and Imposter Syndrome. Love that. Uh, having published eight novels and worked through my own creative self-doubts, I wanted to share what I've learned with my fellow authors. Natasha Bax says, my goal is to finish the first draft and do my first round of edits for my second book. I am doing well on that goal so far. So let's add promote the hell out of book one to the goal line as well brilliant I love it um I don't know if I said what my goals were last time but mostly it is just to finish 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 produce 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 so this week's question is what part of the self-publishing journey do you enjoy the most my book recommendation for the week this week is, of course, it is going to be uh, my own book, my brand new book, Eight Steps to Side Characters, How to Craft Supporting Roles with Intention, Purpose and Power. The pre-order for the ebooks are live and on all of the stores. The paperback for the workbook is now live as well. Um, whether or not the paperback for the textbook, which is the one I know most people are waiting for. Um, I don't know. I am trying to get it live. Uh, what happened last time is that uh, I, I put the pre-order up with Ingram Spark, but I put a version up without the contents page. And then I changed it prior to the launch date, but Ingram Spark still sent out books with the old template in. So what I am avoiding doing is submitting uh, like it to go live until I am 100% sure that all of the, I guess, gremlins have been picked up by advanced readers. I'm still getting a few uh, gremlins come through. So I'm probably going to wait until Monday or Tuesday, I think, and then I'm going to hit release it into the wild, the pre-order on Ingram. And Ingram usually takes a couple of days uh, for it to go through and then for it all to merge and stuff on, on, the, on the different bookstores. So whether or not it will be live by Wednesday, probably not. Uh, usually when it first goes up on Amazon, it always annoyingly says it's out of stock for a while and then like it then says it's in stock. Um, so... I don't know. I'm hoping by the end of next week uh, it will be live. And that's the first week of July as it's the 25th, Friday the 25th, as I record this today. So, yes, one thing I wanted to add, uh, the reason I am also recommending this is if you submit proof of your pre-order, which you can do at sashablack.co.uk forward slash side pre-order, 
if you submit proof of your pre-order, you can be uh, in for two things. The first thing is a sneak peek. I am giving away an exclusive sneak peek only to people who are pre-ordering the book this time. Previously, I did do sneak peeks for um, different groups of people, but this time I'm using it um, as a pre-order uh, sort of um, thank you. And so I'm giving away the first 25 pages uh, for everybody who pre-orders. And then if you submit your proof of pre-order, I am also entering you into a, com a giveaway to win a pile of books um, some and some other goodies that will go along with that as well. So one person will win that, but everybody uh, who submits their proof of pre-order gets a sneak peek look at the book uh, in advance. So yeah, I will leave the link to that in the show notes. And um, yeah, don't forget to pre-order, go and have a look. Um, in all the different places, you should be able to pre-order the, the ebook at least everywhere. Um, so yeah, uh, please do that. <laughs> in terms of personal update, then I don't. I wish I could. I wish I wasn't a senile because I can't remember what I told you last week. And uh, in terms of all of the changes that had happened, I have a feeling that I was talking through um, how I was doing things differently now and I've continued to do that so between 7 a.m and 8 a.m now I get up and I try and write I mean the kid is still interrupting me a lot so I'm definitely not getting a quality hour but I am getting anything between I would say 350 and 800 to 950 words in a morning and that's enough because you know by the end of the week I have another three to six thousand words not six thousand <laughs> great maths there Sasha three to five God, this is why I play with words and not numbers. Three to 5,000 words um, per week. And, you know, I am trying to slip in other bits of writing as well. And I finished recording the audiobook. I have been editing the audiobook. This is the villain's audiobook. Well, I don't know if I had finished that last week. I don't think I had. Oh, guys, I finished recording the audiobook. So that has been wonderful. Also, oh my god, do I have a potty mouth. I have been um, <laughs> taking snippets of some of the <laughs> worst swearing. Not all of the worst. I lost some of the ones. I think bitch tip was one of the ones <laughs> that I had been saying when I was getting frustrated because I had to repeat a line about villains 85,000 times. Um, but yes, yeah, so there are outtakes shall we say that I have been dropping into a, a document a sound document and I did share a few of them with uh, my patrons in slack this week um, and wow I swear a lot when I get cross <laughs> and like aggressive swearing and very rude naughty words so uh, yeah that has been fun like laughing whilst editing and I have to say I've been very surprised <laughs> that the editing is taking longer than the bloody recording editing I'm trying to get it as good as possible and so I'm trying to edit out every single little tiny thing that shouldn't be in there uh, you know because I like to deliver the best possible product because I have pride in my work and so yeah it is taking me quite a bit of time but I am still determined to try and get it all edited in the next couple of weeks and then it will go I've contacted the guy who's going to be doing the mastering and then I still my aim is still to try and have it up and going through the upload channels before the end of July um so that will be launching in August fingers crossed um I'm trying to dedicate you know a good couple of hours per day to doing this editing um so yes, I've been working on that. I have been working on this secret nonfiction project, uh, which I'm hoping is going to be a small book, just sort of 30k. And I hope to release it in January. I don't really want to talk about it just yet because I'm still shaping it and it still feels very tender and it's a little bit different. And yeah, I mean, it's still very much in the writing craft realm, but I hadn't ever intended to write this book. And somebody basically influenced me to do it and you know who you are and therefore I'm doing it and we're just going to see how it goes. What I can tell you however is that when I have asked people what they would like to see from me next um, everybody has mentioned a book on description so I am pretty sure that my next big non-fiction book which will re release next year will be on uh, how to write better description and I have started researching uh, collecting buying books looking at articles things like that 
Um, if anybody has any recommendation uh, recommendations on books that are about description, uh, if you have hung around here for any amount of time now, you will know that I consume information before I then uh, sort of percolate it, let it process, and then uh, decide how I would teach <laughs> on that topic. So yes, I am looking for description books. I have to say it's been quite hard. I've only found about five or six that really look on description. So perhaps that does indicate that there needs to be a book on that in the market. So yes, I think I've commissioned the cover for later this year, like towards the end of the fall, I think. So yes, that one is definitely going to be on train, but I'm just working on this teeny weeny little book that I'm vomiting out right now. Other things that I'm working on, as soon as I have finished um, the editing of the Villains book, audiobook, I am going in to edit Trey for the final time. Uh, so I aim to do that. Like I said, I'll be starting that in July. Uh, I have read reread Keepers. I'm just about to start rereading Victor, uh, which is the second book in that series. And I reckon I've got about 10,000 words to add and just a few things to reshape. But I don't actually think it's going to take me very long to get it finished. So I'm still like, I don't want to say when I'm aiming to publish that one because the fucking thing's like three years out of date. I mean, not out of date. I mean, overdue. But um, I am going to be very cross if I don't get it out this year. <laughs> Let me put it that way. And given that I'm working on it next, there is no excuse, especially because I have outsourced a load of stuff so that I can get on with these bloody projects. Um, I have also been working on drafting The Scent of Death. So yeah, I feel like since I outsourced a load of work, I have been able to do a load more work. Funny how that works. <laughs> stating the fucking obvious but like this is a revelation to me like genuinely this is such a revelation that I actually apparently can work on loads of creative projects I just had to outsource all of the other stuff so I am very very excited I am full of like enthusiasm my motivation has come back I don't feel as lost I know I mentioned a few times that I was feeling lost I don't feel like that anymore I feel like I am doing the right things and working on the right things and my days are crazy now in a good way because I'm working on so many different projects but I also feel like I am making progress and for those of you that know about the Clifton strengths I have achiever at number two and she was really unhappy because I just felt like I was never actually achieving anything because I wasn't working on the right thing but that is different now that I have prioritized the creative work and also I'm excited to share these projects that I've been working on for so bloody long um so yeah oh and the other thing one more creative thing that I'm going to talk about as soon as um I finish editing the villains audiobook I obviously mentioned that most of that time slot is going to be given to editing Trey and Sirens, the three and, book three and four. But I am going to start recording the Anatomy of Prose uh, audiobook as well. It's it's a bit daunting because there's like 127 sections or something ridiculous. Um, but the recording bit doesn't actually take that long. The bit that takes forever is the editing. So yeah, I am going, I am going to get that underway because I have been asked a number of times to record that audiobook. And then once I finish recording that audiobook, I'm then going to go and record side characters after that. So side characters, my aim would be the end of the year, but it really depends how long prose takes. I mean, let's be honest, it took me long enough to get villains done, <laughs> but hopefully I'm different now. Now I have outsourced all of the things. Anyway, I have bollocks on for a really long time. So I really do think we ought to uh, move this on. We, look at me talking about as if I'm multiple people. I think we should move on because I'm sure you're all bored of me. Okay, so Rebel of the Week this week is Candy Glynn Wild. Candy says, around 2007, I transferred from our community college to California State University, Fullerton, to pursue a degree in communications and filmmaking. One of the courses we were required to take was the language of film, a class all about how filmmakers can convey a story through images by using light, shadow, colour, time of day, framing and so on. The professor assigned us to uh, assigned us one or more films to watch per week. 
We had to answer questionnaires about the films to prove we watched them. Unlike most of my classmates, I am very sensitive to certain depictions of violence in film and television. This is why I will never watch the Game of Thrones. Yes, do not watch that series. One of the films was assigned one of the films assigned was about mob activity in East Asia country. I'm sorry I can't remember the country. Um precisely the the sort of film I avoid like the plague so rather than watch the film and potentially be bothered for weeks I searched for the film on the web and looked up every review plot breakdown and content report I could find I'm loving where this is going between all of these articles I was able to glean enough information about the movie to ace (laughs) to ace that week's quiz you legend Uh, without having to watch even one frame my professor had no idea I'd found an alternative way to pass his class I'm proud of my little rebellion because it was a way of standing up for my own mental health no one in college should have uh, troublesome content forced upon them I don't care how attractive those Dutch angles look I love this I love this because what your rebellion was was your uh, you you rebelled against something and in rebelling you stuck to your own personal values and I think that's so important like our values are part of us they are who we are if we break those or violate them just because somebody else is asking us to do something like what does that mean for us and the thing is is that when your values are tested it's scary and daunting and you know in terms of how the college and the professor would have looked at it, they would have seen you as in the wrong. I personally think that was fucking brilliant and an absolute genius rebellion. Um, because, you know, you've got to, to, like you say, keep your mental health intact. So good for fucking you is what I say. Um, okay. As always, we are always in need of more rebellions. This is one of my favourite segments. Every week I get to talk, uh, you know, read your rebellions and um, read them out on the show. And what I'm trying to do now is uh, Becca, who looks after the admin for the podcast, she is actually dealing with the, the rebellions. So you are now getting my full on genuine reaction uh, live as I read them out, which I think is even better because I, you know, cackle uh, for the very first time, which usually means it's a witchy cackle or whatever. You know, you have a filthy laugh. Um, so yeah, I am, I am loving this, and so I'm begging you to please send me in more of your rebellions. I adore your stories, um, and it makes my week. You can hear how much I'm giggling and smiling, uh, getting to read your stories. So yes, please do send them in. You can email me a big story, a little story, or something in between, uh, and you can email them to rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com or Instagram me at Sasha Black Author. Thank you so much, as always, for sending them in. No new patrons this week, but a gigantic thank you to all of my existing patrons. If you would like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, as well as joining me monthly for Poison and Prose Lives um, and all kinds of other things, then you can from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. All right, this episode is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life. So I'm going to play a word from the sponsor and then we will dive in to the episode with Dan. Hi, I'm Stephanie. And I'm Joni. And we're from the Kobo Writing Life podcast. Kobo Writing Life is Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors. And our team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help authors reach new readers around the world. If you're looking for some tips on growing your indie publishing business this year, the Kobo Writing Life podcast is a great resource. We've talked to authors big and small, and they always have something to teach us. One of my favorite episodes from the recent months was our conversation with Karen Slaughter, who's a best-selling crime author with years of experience. She discussed with us her career, delved into what makes a great crime novel, and she talked about the double standards imposed on female crime writers. Karen also told us about her nonprofit, Save the Libraries, and provided some great advice for aspiring authors. In episode 200, we interviewed Kobo CRM marketing manager, Christina Mendez, about marketing your books on a global scale. She provided tips for global messaging, the importance of being universal but not generic. She discusses the different tactic Kobo uses to market ebooks and audiobooks and explains how the Kobo recommendations algorithm works. My favorite part of the interview is when Christina shares her insights about what makes the Kobo customer unique. 
Spoiler alert, the Kobo Rock customer is a voracious reader and they're constantly reading. They love to read long series and the most popular genres are romance and thrillers. If you want to learn more about Kobo Writing Life or our podcast, check out our blog and find us on social media. You can find our podcast on all podcast providers. If you're ready to start your self-publishing journey, you can create your free account at kobo.com slash writing life. Bye Rebels. Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today I am giddy with excitement because I am joined by fellow co-host of the Next Level Authors Podcast, Daniel Wilcox. Daniel is an international best-selling author, award-nominated podcaster, book coach and speaker. He writes dark fiction spanning the genres of horror, post-apocalyptic and sci-fi and helps authors tell the stories they're dying to tell. Hello and welcome, buddy. Hello, thanks for having me. You've been on this show once before in, Mm -hmm. um, I believe it was episode two, actually, uh, which was now at least 18 months ago. So rather than tell everyone your journey, which they can go back and listen to episode two, would you like to tell everyone a little bit about what you've been up to since that first episode? Yeah, I mean, so much has changed and happened. So I think when we recorded, I was probably about... We became friends. Um, I was about, I don't know, seven or eight months into being full time as an author. And around that time, I was doing a lot of ghostwriting. Um, I was working on a couple of my own fiction projects. Uh, I think that was before I published. Yeah, it was before I published my first nonfiction collaboration for authors. But I think I came on to speak to you about collaboration because most of my journey has been working with other authors on books, on podcasts, on scripts, on lots of different things. So um, it's, yeah, I, I think I spoke a lot about there, but actually since then I've kind of done a lot more of my own thing. So I'm still doing a couple of projects where I work with people. And, you know, in that time we started the next level authors podcast where we just, I know I'd say it's some sort of like leveling up your author business, but I think it's just us venting each week about like <laughs> life. Um, but there is, there, there is useful, tangible information in there for people who want to know what the reality of, is of being a full-time author. I think what people get when they watch (laughs) Next Level Authors is like a real insider's view of brutal, savage honesty of exactly how living as a full time author is. And that's what is fantastic. And then and then on top of that, they get two friends venting and ranting at Mm -hmm. each other and then also cheering each other on, because that's also what we do every single week. We are pushing each other. So, yeah, Yeah, I just. I love it. It is a lot of fun as well because it's like we say every every week, it's that touch point in the week where we can literally stop and reflect because we're both very driven, very ambitious people. No. So I think without that as <laughs> <laughs> without that as a checkpoint of, you know, it's a Friday, which it still creeps around every week. Like it does give us that time to just reflect and go, okay, you know, what have we achieved this week? What are we doing for next week? Um and it's a lot of fun along the way. And you know, the, the listeners of the show seem to to love it. Um so yeah, we started that together. And then as of uh, June last year, so we just come up to the anniversary of my first nonfiction, which was Collaboration for Authors. Um, a couple a couple of weeks, no, a week ago, not even a week ago yet, I launched my second nonfiction, which was a self-publishing blueprint. Yeah. And in the span... Don't, don't, don't go into that too much because I'm going to ask you all about that shortly. I won't dig any deeper yet. Yeah. And then, <laughs> yeah, in, the, in sort of the year gap between that, I just, I, I have moved and shifted a lot into... Um, author services and working with authors in a variety of different capacities so uh, it all kind of started around November when I put together a boot camp for NaNoWriMo um, where I took I think we had 20 authors that you know came into the camp I would sit down and do zoom sprints with them every day every day couple of days a week um, I would send motivation every day I would you know keep trackers to make sure that everyone was sort of where they needed to be following up with people and really just putting the heat up people's asses because for people who aren't familiar, NaNoWriMo is the um, challenge where it's 50,000 words in a month. That you oh, it's write funny. I, I thought you were talking about NaNoWriMo. No, I'm not. I'm not going down that. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can fill that apart, but I won't. Um, it's just how I say it, darling. Uh, and so it's like 50,000 words over that that month. And the typical pass rate for NaNoWriMo is, I think, about 20 percent. And we had 78 percent of people in the boot camp complete it. Mm. And so from that, it kind of gave me this this wind, this spur of you know, maybe there's some stuff I can offer to authors to help them achieve the things that they want to achieve. And so I've, you know, become, since that time become a book coach and I've got sort of clients that I'm helping work through their books. 
Um, I run sort of like power hour sessions. I'm still running a weekly writers group in which I take a lot of the principles from the boot camp and then just do that weekly to, to help authors get the words down um, and give them the excuse to write if you're living a busy life. It's kind of, again, that touch point of this is regular, this is when this happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I've just kind of discovered this love of working with other people and seeing what I can add over, or from my experience of, I think I started writing in 2015 and I've now launched 47 books. Um, and I take that knowledge and then I try and give that to other people and help them on their own writing journey. I so a fair that. bit. <laughs> yeah, that is quite a lot in just 18 months. Oh, I've also launched a horror imprint of <clears throat> Devil's Rock Publishing where I publish horror. So And did some anthologies as well. And did some anthologies. Yeah. yeah. Got you are in, such in an overachiever. <laughs> I just I just enjoy doing. Um, yeah, I get it. To my detriment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, don't we all? Um, I love it. I, I think you've smashed out the last 18 months. So like, I'm proud My grey hairs bro. prove it. <laughs> yeah, I'm proud of you, bro. All right. So w- really, we're here to talk about um, the self-publishing blueprint. And I have to say, I have read it. And I, I especially loved the foreword. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course you did, you narcissistic bitch. <laughs> Uh, so for <laughs> listeners, I, of course, wrote his foreword, which is why it's so delightfully fantastic. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I have to say, I thought it was fantastic, like extremely comprehensive uh, guide to help. I would say people who are approaching publishing or, or pe- people who are just dabbling even and thinking about wanting to, to self-publish. And you'll get a really comprehensive like overview of what publishing is um, and how to do it and mistakes to avoid and things that you do need to do and stuff. So I don't know. I mean, I didn't mean to take over this question and tell everyone about it, but you know, I am going (laughs) to praise your book because I thought it was so fantastic. But is there anything else like you could add about the book that you, that you would want to add about the book? (laughs) Yeah, I think the, the big thing is the origin for the book came from common questions that I was getting asked from people that I was directly working with. So whether that's in the writers group that I run, whether that was coaching clients who were approaching writing their first book. Um, it, it really forced me to sit down and go, because I've, I've, I internalize a lot of my process. I'm not a person who writes down the to-do list and, and you know, checks off all the points every time I publish a book. I tend to have sort of like a flow of what I do. Mm-hmm. So it forced me to sit down and internalize uh, and to formalize um, what it was that, you know, went from the beginning of an idea to publishing the book and marketing the book. And you know, the, the book's called The Blueprint because this is what I give in that book is the foundations of, you know, the minimum stuff that you need to do or at least be aware of in order to make smart decisions to self-publish a book. Um, it's by no means um, definitive. There's lots of like other angles and there are certain things that um, I kind of like touch on that could be expanded. But like I say, as a as a foundation for this is how you self-publish a book. Um, these are the steps. That was where it sprang from. So for me, it felt really nice because it was, like I say, informed by other people and again that's one of the 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 nice parts of working with other authors is I get that first-hand insight into some of the the struggles and when you're seeing the same problem again and again and again it's nice to be able to have something where you can say to someone well here's the answer in like a format that you can read or or digest quite easily Mm. and it is it's funny and it is digestible and it's packed full of tips so everybody listening really ought to go and read it (laughs) um All right. So let's dive into some of the content then. Like, what do you think are the overarching steps that a writer needs to do in order to get their books published? So the main sort of touch points are, you know, when you start off, you've got your idea for the book. Um, And pretty much every one of my books starts with with why, like, why is it you want to write this book? Why now? You know, why the genre that you're writing in? What is it that you want this book to tell? And there's no way that I can answer that for people. So it could be that you want to be in the charts and you want to see your book as um, a bestseller and, you know, hit the USA Today bestselling list. That might be one of your whys. Another why might be that, you know, a woman down the street who's suffering from some kind of, I don't know, um, anxiety and you feel like she would benefit from reading something like this. So there's a whole spectrum of why people would write a book and self-publish a book in the first place. So understanding what you're doing it all for, um, looking at, market research so this is one step that a lot of authors do seem to skip over particularly ones that I've, I've been working with is understanding who your competitors are you know where your book's going to fit in that market because once you've got your why you need to understand the the rules of the game that you're playing with or playing in playing with the rules of the game that you're playing in order to know you know what you should be doing with your book because again there are so many different strategies to writing a book and how you approach it and, and the different things you do along the way 
and then obviously you've got the the planning side of it um if you're a potter or a pantser kind of discovering where you sit on that spectrum um you've got the writing of the book going through the different stages of editing collecting beta readers um going down formatting cover design and then that's kind of like all the production side of stuff and then once you've done that you obviously ship over to the platforms and you pick which platforms you want to run the the book on and then over into the marketing although i do also mention in the book the marketing really can start at the beginning depending on how you how you're going to approach um publishing your book yeah so just sort of, that's a very whistle stop tour to the cycle all right so you have a lot of like connections and clients and you see a lot of and speak to a lot of early writers so what do you think are the most common writers uh, most common writers what are the most <laughs> common writers what are the most common mistakes that uh, writers make when trying to publish so I think I'm going to go for, for for two main things here number one I'm going to come back to to market research because the I do speak to a lot of people who you say to them oh what genre are you writing in and they're not entirely sure um, and really you can't write an effective book for publication for sort of best-selling charts and all that stuff if you're not aware of the tropes the expectations that the reader's going to have within that certain genre and I'll say to people oh who are your 10 competitor authors like if you could name 10 authors in the genre that you're looking to write in that are killing it that are doing what you want to be doing and it's pretty often that most people won't be able to name one which I do find surprising because and, and, and I get it because especially as a first-time author, I think a lot of people start writing a book from a place of just the want of writing a book. And um, I'm very aware that my, my chair is very squeaky. Um, so it, it comes from this notion of I want to write a book and writing a book is freaking hard, mm. um, especially when you first approach it. It really is. No one teaches you how to write a book. And for some reason, the expectation is that you have to do it alone and no one can help you until you've gotten to the end of that first draft and you're handing it off to editors and things. And and, and so people tend to write the book as just as they feel like they should, rather than trying to help themselves by planning and informing themselves as best as they can so they fully understand what it is that they get themselves into. Because it's so much easier in the beginning to do your research, to, to at least have some awareness of what the different tropes and expectations are, and then write a sloppy first draft than it is mm. to write a mess of a first draft where you are just literally just hauling dirt the entire way. Um, so, that, so that's one. It's it's taking those early steps to know the beast that you're you're jumping into, um, and then the the other one is expecting that your process is going to be your process forever when you first written a book. And so judging from your expression, truth. Uh -huh. yeah, oh, yeah, that you, one you, that that cuts in my soul. That truth. <laughs> yeah, because you speak to so many first time authors, and you'll say, that, "Are you a plot or a pantser?" And they're so convicted in in what they believe that they are and i'm not saying that people are wrong at all especially when you first go into that you have to approach it in the best way that you can but your process won't really appear to you until you're at least a minimum of four or five books down the line mm. and even then it's sort of the seeds of oh okay now i'm starting to form connections of i write better at these times in the morning i'm better when i plan this much i'm better if i know this part of the story in advance um so i think the thing that slows a lot of people down is this need, this expectation to understand what writing is the first time round. Mm. And that's just not what's going to happen. And also that is one of the biggest hurdles. So that once people have published that first book and maybe it doesn't go to the roaring success they were expected because you have poured your heart and soul into the book and you've given mm -hmm. it everything. And like I say, writing is hard. Even it doesn't matter how many books you publish, like it's difficult. Um, and then that's when people step back because they go, Oh, I've, I clearly can't do this. And it's like, no, it's because it's your first book. I, I love this question. Uh, well, I love this answer so much. And I know that one of my patrons in particular is going to be cursing because <laughs> <laughs> last night in uh, the Patreon Poison and Prose, a question came up about process and consistency and they know who they are and they know I know who they are. <laughs> so this is a little nod to them to say, I hope you're listening. Uh, uh, and yeah, anyway, so I love that so much. And it's so true like and I definitely like and I was and this was actually funny enough what I said last night as well I didn't know that I had a process until you asked me the question on next level authors how do you write or what is your writing process or whatever the question was and I <clears throat> my gut response was I don't have one I don't know and then 
like as I was telling you how I write you were like oh so you do have a process then because you were able to like pick out those repetitive consistent things that I did um and it's just that there are elements of each book that change you know Mm -hmm. like there are some stories I know every single ounce and bit of description about before I start and then there are other stories that I know the ending and one thing in the middle and something but you know but the how I do it does actually tend to be exactly the same which you know but also I think there is this is why having a community and talking to other people is really beneficial because Mm -hmm. that process of talking to other people and saying oh well this is how I do it and verbalizing that I mean for me because I like the act of verbalizing because it helps me to make things conscious um but for me that act of verbalizing and talking about it enabled me to step out of myself get out of my own asshole and see that there was elements of consistency and yet still I am tweaking and I am changing and I'm making more effective and you know I think that as much as people who like to have a consistent you know do it that way every single time I think it is also important to be open to the prospect Mm. of potentially tweaking in the future as well, Um, because you may come across things that work better for you. So, yeah, I love what people have to understand as well. Is it? It's not just it's not just the process of writing that you, you, you want to get consistent. Like if you had an entirely clean slate and, you know, the same routine and everything every day you could probably keep some kind of consistency but the fact as well is you've got an entire life around you of personal Mm. circumstance that on a day-to-day basis can change a lot so whether it's because of a global pandemic or whether it's just because i don't know your goldfish has died like there are going to be small things that do interrupt those patterns so it's it's like consistency i've been looking for consistency for six years and i can't find it so i've now you know i just i do the best i can with the time that i've got it adjusts depending on what's going on in life and then i just I just write, I just make it happen despite, you know, any, anything that comes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. So a lot of writers get really overwhelmed by a launch. And I say that like in air quotes because launch (laughs) is different to everybody, but so I guess, can you like talk through the minimum viable launch versus something that is bells and whistles because I think it's really important that writers and newer writers who haven't necessarily published yet understand that launch is on a spectrum and Mm -hmm. we don't have to do everything it's okay not to do everything yeah I think it comes back again to that idea of sort of like first book versus you know having loads down the line and having it having a bit of a backlist um and I will uh I won't name it by name but I know that we were talking to a friend the other day about launching her new non-fiction And I think that what people have to remember is readers will buy into you once they've witnessed your work. And so it's very, very difficult for a first book in a particular genre when um, people launch it and expect lots of readers to flock to that. Like it's, it's not impossible, but it's, it's hard and it might cost you quite a lot of money. Um, My, my personal view is that with your earlier works, just, just start publishing. And by that, I literally mean like my first few books, I, you know, wrote the books, I formatted them, put a cover on them, and then I put them online. And it was very, very basic. I did, you know, a couple of sort of social media posts. I approached a couple of local writing groups and said, like, I've produced a book, here it is. Um, And and that was enough for the beginning. So I think you can, if you're worried about um, just the process of publishing, the, the bare, bare minimum, you can just put a book up and then just watch and see how it does. And I think with each book that then comes, you're creating a portfolio, a CV that readers can look at and go okay well they've published more than one work so they must be serious about what they do which means that as a reader you're probably going to get a better writing experience and you can invest more in 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 this author if you know you like their work um so i think don't be scared very very early on in your journey to put the book up and you know just flail a little bit when it comes to that launch like it, it it is difficult to to try and get that sort of momentum um but then if you want to look really at the, the bells and whistle sides, there's, there's so much you can do. So the first thing that I'd advise to people is either after you finish your first draft of your novel or before you've approached that, write a goddamn reader magnet. Mm. Because once you've got a reader magnet, again, you've got something tangible and physical that you can put out into the world that starts creating your audience ahead of finishing that book. So if I you know, came into it as a, a fresh author with sort of like the experience I have now, the first thing I would do would be write, I'd plan whatever that first book is. And then I'd write a reader magnet that relates to that book in some way, whether that's a character or a scene that's missing or something. And 
it would be, I don't know, something between like five or 15,000 words. And then there are loads of different sites. You've got like Book Funnel, you've got Prolific Works, you've got Story Origin, where you can put that book up and you can put it in parts of giveaways with newsletter swaps and start making that work for you and building your audience while you're then writing the, the actual book itself because it's building an audience is difficult. Um, and this is probably the most time efficient way that I'm aware of to do it. And then once you've got that first book finished, by the time that's ready to publish, you could have, I don't know, 12, 15, 100, 200, however many people who enjoyed your reader magnet, who have some investment in whatever that first book is and are actually looking to, to um, jump in and buy that book. And you give yourself like a little bit of a stepping stone there advantage over if you were just to launch that book cold out into the world and then ask people to buy it. Because again, you have to understand that readers, all readers care about, they don't care about anything else other than having a good experience while they're reading that book and loving the story. So give them a taste of that and then give them sort of the, the, the main dinner. Um, and then on top of that, you've got things like, um, obviously you can sort out pre-orders. So that's quite useful for building hype because if you've got a pre-order, when it comes to a cover reveal where you post and show everyone what your beautiful cover is, at least you have somewhere where you can direct people to. Because I think a common mistake pe that people make is they do the cover reveal because they're excited about the cover. And you should be because, you know, it's really exciting to have a book cover for your story. Um, but if you put a book cover reveal out and say, here's my book, and then you're not re um, releasing that book for another three or four months, the way that the internet works, the way that people's attention works is they, they will forget you in that time. So reveal the cover, but have somewhere where people can go to actually pre-order it or commit to buying that book when they're excited about it. Um, and then you've got things like you can do giveaways around different things in your genres. Um, newsletter swaps with other authors. Obviously, like I mentioned, sites like Book Funnel, Prolific Work, Story Origin, there's probably a few others that are just really useful for meeting other authors and finding the right people to actually share your book with and getting them in front of other people's audiences so they can then come back to you. And I do think there's a very um, abundance mindset in the, in the author space. Quite a lot of people I've approached are very, very generous with sharing books in their newsletters, as long as obviously mm -hmm. like you're kind and you pay that back and you handle that relationship well. Um, and then the the ultimate crux of, you know, throwing throwing money into things like Facebook ads, AMS ads, BookBub ads, all that kind of paid marketing, which um, is probably a bit too too deep to, to go into now. But yeah, there's a whole there's a whole plethora of things that you can do. And there's like you say, there's no one right way to do it. It's an entire spectrum of, of how you launch. The self-publishing blueprint was probably my most active launch in terms of the things that I did to try and generate hype and reach different people. Um, but I have I have published books before just to just to my mailing list or, you know, earlier on just to social media. So just don't feel like you need to be in a certain place to publish. Just try and put yourself in the best position that you can to publish and do a launch that you're happy with. Mm. Totally agree. What is your your time, your energy, your money like? What will what is your goal? All of these things factor into how much you can or should yeah. do i suppose I, I will add launches can be exhausting I spent, I spent most of saturday in bed with a migraine so <laughs> i i used everything that i had and then slept <laughs> yeah i don't i completely agree i am usually absolutely fucked by the end of a launch mm -hmm. um but then you know that's because i try to be more on the bells and whistles end than not but without paid advertising so I don't really enjoy doing paid advertising I do a bit of it but not like a lot because uh, yeah I'd rather I play with it a little bit but I profess I'm no expert in paid ads yeah exactly I would prefer to do thing. this and to talk to people and to do lives and to do all of the other stuff than I would to fuck about with fucking Facebook eating my and, money and you can and the people that tell you you have to do certain things in your launch are lying to you they are lying they are there is always lies. a way to do it there is like uh, publishing on Amazon and going KDP select or just uh, Kindle Unlimited only is not the only way. Going wide is not the only way. Like I've seen authors that make a feral career just selling books at conventions. I've seen mm -hmm. authors make a living, like a really good living from Kickstarter campaigns. Like there's no one right way. You just have to find the way that you enjoy, that you feel you can do consistently to build the audience. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Um, Paddy just made like over a hundred grand on a Kickstarter. Ridiculous money. Congratulations, Ridic Paddy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just like bow at his feet. Like what a, a <laughs> magnificent feat to have done that. I was sort of watching it 
with only a vague understanding of what it was he was actually doing but I was just like this is amazing game, isn't it? I thought it was that but I did like I didn't want to say in case I was wrong <laughs> I think so. um, I think it was yeah but connected to his books I think right something mm-hmm. like that yeah yeah that's what yeah. I thought it's phenomenal anyway and it's uh definitely one to go and uh, yeah. have a look. and patreon as well patreon can be really really good for for authors if they can you know tap that vein correctly absolutely people like nk jemison have huge followings uh like thousands of patrons uh on there and uh what's the other lady uh sean or shannon shannon mcguire or whatever her name i don't know how to say her name the one who did <laughs> the um series of novellas and uh mm. anyway let's move on all right You've got a very whizzy diagram in your book, uh, which you whizzy. call <laughs> which you call the self-publishing cycle. Can you talk listeners through what that cycle is and what it looks like in practice? Yeah, so the reason I I kind of included it was because self-publishing really is it's a cyclical train. Um, I think you know you can you can go ahead and just publish one book, but I think the the most well-trodden path of success is to keep publishing and to just keep getting better and to keep growing and build your backlist. And that's essentially how you get the exponential growth from making a couple of cents per month to however, however much you want to. Um, and I think because of the nature of how I laid things out in the book, it's very, very step by step. Um, it just it just felt right to kind of cap it off for this. So I'll just go around the cycle quickly. So number one is find your why, which we've spoken about. Um, number two is do your market research. Number three is plan your story. Number four is write the book. Number five is edit the book. Number six is cover design. Number seven is format the book. Number eight is hit publish. Number nine is promote the book. And then you're right back around to the beginning again, working on the next book. And, you know, some of those can be um, stretched out to promote your book. Once you've got that first book, you can just keep, you know, doing that alongside the rest of the publishing cycle. But in terms of actual publishing, um, that's that's kind of why I went down the blueprint route because although there are so many different ways to publish and different nuances of what you can do for different sides of things, the basic steps of getting a book from idea to publish and selling it are are the same. It's you know there's no there's no magic to it. It's just you do the same things. You cycle around. The magic comes in the different stories that you choose to tell and sort of uh, whether that's like in series. Yeah, you know, how you play around in, in different genres, which I wouldn't advise genre hopping. I've been there and it slowed me down. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a cycle. And I think that a lot of people, for me, the, the main point of that was to show people that it's not over once you've done that first book. Mm. Like the best way to sell your last book is by working on the next book and putting more content out there for your readers. So eat, sleep, write, publish, repeat. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant screw you <laughs> <laughs> but yes yes okay so you have a lot of experience in the industry now you've been writing for a long time um and I think over the last 18 months you've had a rapid like development change growth so what do you think are the most significant lessons you've learned through your publishing career so far I think the biggest one is work on the things that keep your fire alive. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and so that comes from a place of, you know, I, I ghostwrite for clients. I've um, been careful. I say this, I I ghostwrite for clients. I've written some books that aren't necessarily within the wheelhouse of the stuff that I normally write. Um, I've been down the the journey of sort of aiming more for money over the, the passion of it all. And I think every time that I hit my lowest peak of um, or lowest trough of um, sort of enthusiasm and desire to keep on working, it comes from a place in which I'm not working on something that I'm enjoying or something that isn't really fueling that passion. So, you know, it's, it's very, very easy to look down all the shoulds of, you know, what you should be writing, what's selling, what's hot. And some people do very, very well with writing to market. Um, but it's always when I have a project that is, deeply mine that I really find the most enthusiasm and the love of this kind of industry and that's not to say that's all you can do like I think there's a point of balance and I know we've had conversations about um obviously there's a bunch of necessities that you have to do in order to keep an author business alive Mm. but as long as you've got something that is yours that you know keeps you excited to get to the keyboard keeps you excited to keep getting involved and putting the stuff out then that kind of 
that can compensate for everything because I've, I've spoken to a lot of authors who um, they start off writing because they love the idea of the story they're telling. And then for, you know, a million different reasons, they find themselves on a treadmill of having mm. to do X, Y, or Z or like, oh no, but I have to do it this way or I have to do this. And I think there's, I'm never going to say if you want to be commercially successful, just for you, like there's always an element of, you know, you have to play within certain boundaries of um, what readers expect in order to do well. But at the same time, readers can tell when you're enthusiastic about a project and when you're really putting your heart and soul into it. So really finding the things that keep your fire alive and um, just coming, working from a point of passion will just, will just keep you going long-term. And I think that's sort of a big part of sustainability because I used to think it was, you know, I, I started getting into this industry because I, well, I just wanted to write a book and I liked horror and I just wanted to see my name on a book that sits on my shelf. And as time goes on, you get a bit greedy. I have. <laughs> and then you get to a point where you're like, I'm burned out. It's because I'm not enjoying this as much as I was enjoying it at the beginning. And so I do, with everything that I do now, try and take a step back and go, OK, how does this balance over the whole scope of things? Um, but then at the same time, like I say, if you're in this to be a career author, as Jane Zach often like to say, you still need to understand that there are, there's going to be an element of um, work that you have to do that is just part of the business, like like in any job. Like if you go into your nine to five, there's going to be stuff that maybe you enjoy a bit more, but stuff that you just have to do because that's just part of what your role is, what, what you've chosen to do. Mm. Um, I'm trying to remember what, because uh, I had a conversation with this about, with um, my co-writer, Luke Condor, and we were talking about, um oh, what was it it was something to do with the sexy side of stuff and like the necessary side of stuff but the necessary side of stuff wasn't the right word but it was it's that balance of like knowing that one thing that you do is going to be like just purely for you just purely passion like you really want to invest in it and get it out but then you offset that and balance that with the thing that you have to do and it's kind of like this juggle of um just trying to keep somewhere in the middle and just trying to keep sane and safe and enjoying enjoying what you're doing so that's 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 pretty much the biggest one and i think that transcends into all parts of your writing most most of the times when i sit and talk with coaching clients it will be they'll think that the the stumbling block is you know they're not getting the words in or that their books aren't selling or things like that and a lot of that problem can be boiled down to are you enjoying the thing that you're doing mm. and if you are it's very very easy to carry on do the words if you're not then that's definitely going to be slowing you down because your mind's going to be telling you i'm not having fun here so i'm going to procrastinate and watch youtube for three hours i've been there um but then on on oh my train of thought's totally gone well that's fine because this is a perfect segue <laughs> <laughs> because my next question in fact my next two questions are about coaching so you mm -hmm. are a writing coach okay. what the fuck is one of those and what do you actually do ah <laughs> next no i am um, so i i first came across this concept uh early last year when um i came across jenny nash from author accelerator on like a thousand different podcasts she's a wonderful human being i vibed hard with a lot of the things that she was saying and we kind of mentioned it already a bit earlier in the show but i find it absolutely bizarre that writing is one of the only things in life where there's no training there's no prep there's no qualification i'm definitely not saying you need a qualification for writing because that's bullshit but there's no like people come to the page and they're like i'm gonna write a book and they stumble and you know they trawl through crap until they reach you know, that first draft and for some people that can take a couple of months for some people that can take 10 years plus before you finish that first draft because and i've said this before i'll say it again writing is hard so what a book coach does is a book coach is essentially someone who runs on beside you think of it as you know if you're going to go to the gym and get fit you have a personal trainer, you have someone that can accelerate what you're doing, can give you targeted exercises, things that are going to help improve your performance, get you the results that you want. So a, a book coach is, is just that for authors. So most of my time is spent, um, I do sort of uh, regular weekly check-ins with clients um, in which we sort of discuss what it is they're trying to achieve, what they want to do. We look at writing schedules and we look at trying to increase productivity where we can we look at, you know, the craft of the story and whether they have the right things in place to tell the story that they're trying to tell. And it, it really is, it's just, it's essentially having your own personal mentor alongside you while you're going through that experience of writing a book. And it's not just, it's not just first time authors that you work with, because there are people who 
have written a few books, but they're still not quite hitting where they want to be. And so the, the stuff that I work on, it can go from anything um, from sort of mindset to craft, to um, productivity, to marketing and business. Like there's a whole scope of it. And again, part of that was part of what I go through is distilled into the self-publishing blueprint. Um, because again, that was informed by some of the clients and the people that I work with. But yeah, it's mostly just someone who is with you and can essentially or potentially shave off years of heartache and struggle by just picking apart the crap and just giving you the answers that you might have spent months searching for. I know that, like, I love a good conference. I really do. I love networking at conferences and being around other writers. There's, there's like an energy in that room that you can't get anywhere else. But at the same time, I don't go to conferences for the sort of tangible stuff that you take away. And even the bits that I do do, there's still a lot of homework that you have to do by yourself and you still have to try and fumble and learn it. But, you know, if you've got someone next to you that week on week, you can just say, oh, here's the thing that I'm struggling with. How did you overcome this? And they give you an answer. You, you know, it's, it's just infinitely helpful to you as a writer to get to where you're trying to get faster. Mm. And so what do you find yourself saying most often? Like in those, like, what is the piece of advice that you find I don't know. Yeah. Like repeating the most. I don't think it's going to surprise you. Um, most of what I do is give authors permission to be themselves. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't expect that, but that isn't a surprise. Yeah. 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 It's funny, isn't it? How caught up we get. I, even our, even when you are naturally a rebel, you still mm-hmm. get caught up in what you are being told or what you should be doing or, you know, expectations that society even like the indie community places on us and yet like in the very act of creating is rebellious Mm -hmm. you know like it's a very weird conflicting kind of concept I don't know yeah Yeah. like it is it is a funny thing I think I didn't I did not expect that but I love that I love it takes it takes a certain person like you say to go, I'm not going to spend my free time watching Netflix or like yeah. hanging out with my friends. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to write. Um, immediately, you're, you're putting yourself against against the grain. And I remember my old day job, there was a point in which a lot of my colleagues were sitting and they were having these sort of lunchtime meetups. They'd all finish at the same time and, and go and sit and eat food. And I'd end up walking past them to go to the library so I could sit and write. And just that feeling, there's like a gravity that you you feel like you're pulling against in order to, to do the thing. And... Like, like you say, so many people, they expect writing to be the same for everyone. So, you know, you go to the page and they're like, oh, it must be like, I don't know, like Phil or Susan is <laughs> sitting down and having the same problems. But no one lives your life. Mm-hmm. No one has pets that wake you up in the middle of the night. No one, or I'm saying this slightly incorrectly, not everyone has pets that wake you up in the middle of the night. Some, some of your friends have kids, some don't. Some have different daytime schedules. Some are night people, some are morning people. Some are at a point in their life where they might be a bit more overweight and that's affecting their energy. Some might be underweight and that's affecting their energy. And there are so many different variables to what comprises someone's life that whatever cocktail you have is going to be different to someone else's. Mm. So when people say to me, I don't understand why so-and-so is writing 500 words an hour and I'm only able to get 300. And I'm like, well, you're number one, you're different people. It's not impossible to get there. But in order to get there, we have to understand what your life is how you can make those tiny little changes to make that happen. Um, and on the other side, it might be, you know, that's not possible for you because of the way that you work. This isn't, I feel, I see you smiling and I, this isn't a dig at you. <laughs> no, it's because this is like the most number one individualization answer I've ever heard, but keep going. <laughs> yeah, but because it's not like, I think, so individualization through the whole Gallup Strengths thing, from my understanding of it and what I've kind of learned about myself is yes, I can see the individualized, but that doesn't discount the individualized as a whole for people. So the truth is that 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 reality does exist. It's just not that everyone can like see it because you get so stuck in your lens and perception of what your life is, Mm. that it's sometimes difficult to see how other people live. And so that, you know, is one of the things that I've embraced as, um, and it it sounds a bit (laughs) egotistical, but like, that is one of my superpowers is that I'm able to sit down and say to someone, okay, like, recall the last 24 hours and tell me the different like parts of your life that have been like an obstacle that you triumphed over and then from that you can then extract some of the wider things that are causing 
friction points for authors to achieve the things that they're trying to achieve. So that's kind of stuff I go I, I go into. Um, I'm just going like to call you out because it is not egotistical to have a superpower. Everybody has a superpower <laughs> and that is just what your natural gift is and you should be proud and embrace it. And it is true. It is your superpower. And uh, it's not ego at all to yeah. say that. I will uh, tell... I will shout from the rafters about how competition is my uh, superpower. <laughs> <laughs> Although I swear my superpower is more like the unyielding determination <laughs> to never quit and get mm-hmm. reach the goal. But I keep moving the goalpost up. Yeah. Anyway, well, I, right. Well, hold on. Go on. I was going to say one, um, one other thing on that is one very, very interesting part of the coaching side of things is because people do have their perception of what you know is achievable and what they can do with with themselves sometimes you get a point where you know that a thing needs to change and sometimes you come up against such a point of resistance from the person that you're working with that you then there are certain things you have to learn when to let go as well because mm. people have to come to things at the right time so there are certain points where um i do have to sit back and strategically go okay this author is struggling with this this thing could help but they're very very resistant against that So then I sit back and I wait for that right time to then bring that round and be like, okay, because sometimes you really have to experience the thing yourself to learn from it. And it doesn't matter how many people tell you the thing. um, You you still have to go through that, that sort of trial by fire yourself to come out on the other side. Key example of that recently, everybody, for me personally, lesson that I've learned recently, everybody always talks about just write the next book and how um, you need to focus on publishing uh, or or not necessarily books, but whatever, you know, creating more in your empire, be it audiobooks, courses, podcasts, or merchandise, or, um, you know, uh, whatever it is in, in your, in your, your sphere that is your creating. And, and I would smile and nod and say, yes, and I could parrot that back out to people. But I did, and I knew it. I did know it, but I didn't know it. I didn't. Mm-hmm. It and it was. It was a very odd change. And I spoke about this. Uh, well, in terms of when we are recording, it will be the podcast that came out this week. But uh, obviously, this is coming out in a couple of weeks. <laughs> time travel. Um, yeah, time travel. But um, my dad had a conversation with me, and he said uh, because basically my goal had all has always been to earn X number of pounds. Right. And he was like, but why are you chasing money? You are a creator. You are a creative. And if your goal is money, why don't you just go and be a fucking banker in London? Like, why don't you just go and start working for a hedge fund? And I was like, oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. this is why people say you need more books or you need more Mm -hmm. and I was like and it was and it was like this fucking earth shattering realignment like I felt a physical realignment inside my chest as I was like oh yeah and his his following I mean I swear my dad is a genius sometimes he just knows how to say things in the right way in the right language to me I think it's also because he's competitive but anyway and then (laughs) he 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 goes to me he says um you know if you are if your goal and your focus is on uh production or or creation even the money will follow the creation he was like but you you have plateaued because you are not pushing out any more things like this year I've not published anything well we're six months into the mm-hmm. year I haven't published a new course I haven't published an audiobook I haven't published a book so of course my income is not going to increase and he was like the money will follow the production you just have to keep producing and it was fucking shattering and um yeah like the, it was one of those things I will never ever ever forget and yeah. but I had to hear it and hear it and hear it and go through that and live it in order to learn that lesson. Mm -hmm. And it was only as I was going through that plateau and then that realization that I was like, Oh shit. Cause you, you've said it to me countless times. Like every time a book comes out, it rises because that is, you know, the trend of successful self-publishing. I know. But then yeah, you have to, you have to, and I'm, I'll give a very, very brief example for myself. Like I know that 
um, my mind gets, because I work on a lot of stuff at once. Number one, I'm trying to bring that down because I know that I work better on fewer things if I'm mm. really sort of getting deep into them. But number two, I also knew that I needed some kind of like to-do system to keep things together because I have a whiteboard that I basically would just scribble things on all the time and I was getting really fragmented in my mind. And on Monday, I basically spent most of half of the morning just creating that thing. And I can't tell you how like infinitely free my mind is now that I've done it. And the thing is, I know this because I've done to do this before in specific ways that work for me that for some reason I just fell off that bandwagon. And then every, every day I'm like, oh, I need to be doing this, but you just don't. And then it's when you do the stuff, you're like, oh, now I'm being productive again. How have you structured it? So I've got um, basically what I call, so I'm doing it on Asana. I have um, what I call a dump list, which is all of the things. And then I categorize those so that in the side, I have mini projects set up that they kind of categorize into. So whether that's like my nonfiction, my fiction, um, you know, personalized different things. And then every morning I now sit for about 10, 15 minutes and I put like three of the main things I want to achieve. Uh, and then once I've completed those, I can then drag anything else from the rest of the list I'm trying to get rid of. Cause again, I'm trying to compress a lot of the stuff that I was doing. And then one thing that I took from Chris Kane, when she came on next level authors um, last week, you know, well, you know, time travel, all that stuff um, is keeping that done list because mm. I do spend most of my week going, I've not done anything or I get to like three o'clock and be like, I've hardly done anything today. And I've now got this list of things that I've ticked off. That I'm keeping throughout the week for sort of timestamp each day. And it is huge. <laughs> <laughs> do you know the funny thing um i uh gave as you know i know li listeners might i don't know if i can't remember if i said it but i um commissioned out a lot of work recently uh to a va and um for the first time in a really really long time i am getting to the end of working days and feeling like i have achieved something and and yes. and if anything in a weird way, I'm doing slightly less yep. because I, you know, there aren't as many tick offs as there would have been. But what I am doing is creating. I have already written almost a thousand words this morning before the school run. Right. And then after and now I've created a new episode, which is content. And then after this, I'm immediately going into the audio booth and I'm going to record another chapter, you know, so like. And each of those things is another thing that will be put out into the world. And because my focus and my goal is now aligned to the actions that I'm doing, everything mm -hmm. feels right and better. And yeah, I don't know. It's, it's I'm very happy to hear. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Let's stop bollocksing on. This is a rebel author. <laughs> I've missed bossy Sasha. I know. <laughs> This is the Rebel Author Podcast. Tell us about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. Okay, so I think I gave a really weak example on the last one. And then afterwards, I was like, oh, I should have used this example. And I'm glad to be on again. So when I was in my first year of secondary school, which I don't know what grade that would be to us people, but I was about 11. Uh, I, I was with a group of friends and I went out at break time, which for us around then was 15, 20 minutes. And there was a, a series of picnic tables that me and my friends sat down because we were like, we're going to sit and have some food. And for no reason whatsoever, a group of year nines came over who, you know, 13 year olds, two years older, and they came up to us and went, oh, that's our bench. Like, that's where we sit at lunch. Um, and there were like five other empty benches around. And I went, well, all my friends got up and walked and sort of started walking away. And I just sat there and just went, no, you can, you can go on another bench, please. Um, I was nice about it. And then they kind of like crowded around in a typical, you know, high school drama way. And they were like, we, we need you to move. And I just went, no, I'm, I'm not moving. Like there are other benches. And my friends stood about 10 feet away watching the entire thing. And so I sat there while they proceeded to smush banana into my hair and pour a can of Coke down my back, which made all of my shirt sticky. And my friends kind of watched in horror as I then started singing, I shall not be moved. <laughs> ah. And in the end, a teacher came out because they'd seen the whole thing on CCTV. They all got bollocks. I got a house point and um, I won. I love it. I love that your rebellion had Still a Still to this day, I don't know why I did it, but it just <laughs> it just felt so unjust. And I was like, no, I I and once you get to a certain point, you're like, I can't turn back now. This this is this is where I planted my flag. <laughs> yeah, you have to die on that hill now. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, that I awesome. love that. That is a proper rebellion. And those little mm-hmm. fuckers as well. Oh, if I had been at your school, I'd have laid them out for you. Don't worry. I'd have got your back. Oh, I'd have come mate. running back into that fight. In fact, I probably wouldn't I don't have doubt. left. I, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have left. I think that was the weirdest thing is watching your friends just like, because there was like a point of pride from sitting there and doing it. But at the yeah. same time, I was like, what are you guys doing? You're just yeah. standing and watching the whole thing. Yeah, like I am not that person. I dive into a fight to help my friends. Like I, I will. I, yeah, I like. I don't leave my friends hanging. <laughs> I am uh-huh, there, uh-huh. and then usually I'm like wading and like shoving them back. And, like, <laughs> like, Imagine the troll at the end of the Lord of the Rings is coming through like. No, <laughs> Not calling you a troll. I'm just putting that out. <laughs> Cheers, Dad. God, you're not coming back on the podcast. <laughs> Aww. I'm joking. All right. Tell everyone where they can find out more about you, your books, and anything else you would like to add. Sure. Everything about me is at www.danielwilcox.com. And that's Wilcox, W-I-L-L-C-O-C-K-S, which is like the longest way to do it. And then I am on social media at pretty much most places at Wilcox Author. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. It's been a blast. Ah, oh, and of course, thank you to all of the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, as well as getting to join me for Poison and Prose, and me sending you random, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of what the word is. I sent this. Um, look at me ruining my outro. I sent <laughs> this, uh, this uh, uh, minute long of audio, uh, basically telling them to get on with all their work, but in a very Sasha Black way. It was nice. Fun. Yeah. Anyway, then you can do so by visiting uh, patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. And of course, a gigantic thank you to everybody listening. I'm Sasha Black. You are listening to Daniel Wilcox. And this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week, I'm joined by another Daniel, uh, but this time by Daniel O. (laughs) His surname also begins with a W, but it's Daniel Wallace. Uh, I was uh, delighted to speak at his uh, conference recently, the Style and Voice, I think he actually called it a summit. But regardless, um, I will be talking to him all about how to run and host events for authors. It's a really interesting uh, conversation. And even if you haven't necessarily wanted to host one, it's quite a interesting insight into how they get uh, hosted and what is involved. So join me next week for that. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.